Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome to the OCD and Related Disorders Lecture Series brought to you by OCD Massachusetts. And just so you know, OCD Massachusetts is an official affiliate of the International OCD Foundation, which is located here in Boston. My name is Carla Kenny. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and I specialize in the treatment of OCD. I work with children, teens, and adults. And I'm also president of OCD Massachusetts. So we have a great hour ahead of us. And um, I think what we'll just do is I'll have my co-host Sean introduce himself and then we will just go ahead and get started with our panelists. So again, thank you so much for being here and showing your support. We really appreciate it. Sure, yeah. So. So my name is Sean Shinnick. I'm on the board of directors for OCD Massachusetts, and I'm also an OCD advocate in my own right, uh, someone with lived experience. Uh, I'm an artist, illustrator. I work for McLean Hospital and their advocacy, um, uh, not department, but uh, the things I do for them is, is advocacy work. And uh, I do some mental health projects. And it's really exciting to be here tonight because uh, I had OCD, or struggled with OCD heavily during my teen years, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panel uh, about their experiences uh, specifically uh, during their, these, these young years. So uh, tonight we have Caroline, Ivy, and Jenna uh, telling their stories, answering some questions, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Jenna. Hi guys, my name's Jenna. Um, I am currently 19 years old, so I'm a soft, I'm going into sophomore year of college. Um, and I was diagnosed with OCD in the third grade. Um, that was really challenging just because I at first didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what OCD was. I also have PANDAS disorder, so that is um, just another anxiety autoimmune disorder that goes along well with OCD. Um, so that was really challenging in the third grade and I I didn't notice what was going on with myself. There was just a different um, aspect to life, really. Um, I explained it as something like living inside me. It wasn't really me that was doing these things, but it would be things like flipping off the light switch up and down, um, doing little ticks like eye blinking, there's severe eye blinking, um, just things like that. And my mom had noticed it. I was crying. I was like severely depressed. I didn't know what was going on. And that's just a really scary feeling because there was no way to stop it. And I just couldn't stop it or I would throw up. That was my thing. Um, and so my mom started like researching it a little bit and found out about pandas and OCD. And then I went to see a therapist and then I'll later talk about my journey with therapists. But um, then I ended up like eight or nine therapists later with Carla um, and I did CBT therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy. And that was just a lifesaver, to say the least. Um, I had my first moment with Carla, and I said, Mom, she is so mean. She's trying to hurt my feelings. She's <laughs> treating me. Can't do this. Um, she's making me do things I don't want to do. And the reality is, yes, she was, but that was only to make it better. Um, I, my huge fear is throwing up, and now I can see people actually puke in front of me without having a little anxiety attack and going off and crying and screaming and asking them for reassurance. So that's really nice. Um, my mom has been like a huge help for me. And if I was on my own, like older, I would not have gone back to Carla. I would not have gone to see another therapist right there. It would have been done and I would have been suffering the rest of my life. So that was my mom, like pushing me was definitely like a huge help because then I just kept going from there and I got so much better. Um, so yeah, and then lastly, like today, I um, am part of like a disability awareness um, club at my school, um, best buddies, things like that, because I believe that advocacy is just such a huge, important thing and helping other people. And I'm going to, I'm a social work major, so I'm hoping to just help others. And I want to be that person that I really needed when I was younger. Um, it's obviously great for people like Carla that study it and uh are just there to help you out and they know so much about it. Uh, but also having it myself, like Sean was saying, is also another huge thing. And I want to be able to hear people's stories and kind of respond to them and help them with that. Um, and just people like today, now I'm able to get through stressful situations and I'm just a lot stronger and more confident myself. So I'm glad to, to be here today. Thank you. Yeah. I was just, just want to quickly interrupt. 
I just realized that we haven't actually defined what OCD is. So there may be people that have joined the panel um, or joined the talk and they don't actually know what OCD is. Does anybody want to describe it? Um, yeah, I can. Go ahead, Ivy. Um, so OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder and it is what it sounds like. O is for obsessive, C is for compulsion, D is for disorder. Um, so an obsession is something that um, you're like constantly thinking about, something that you're constantly worrying about. And typically that that obsession will make you anxious. And that leads to the urge to do a compulsion, which is like a physical action that you'll do to try and get rid of the anxiety that the obsession causes. And a disorder is something that like negatively impacts your life. So that kind of breaks OCD down a little bit. And there's a like a vicious cycle of it where it's like there's a thought that triggers anxiety, which triggers the urge to do a compulsion, which leads to temporary relief. And then that process starts all over again when you think of um, another obsession. So I don't know if that was a good explanation or not. <laughs> really good. <laughs> Thanks, oh, Thanks Abby. It was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess, Caroline, you were going to introduce yourself next, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm 16 years old, and I'm just finishing grade 10 of high school. Um, ever since I was little, I've been a really big, like, warrior, and I've always been super anxious, and I've always seen a, I used to see a general therapist um, with my family, and we, or me, my mom, <laughs> would go and see her just for anxiety and normal stuff. Um, but around age eight or nine, I noticed that things were a little off with my anxiety. I started checking things around my room. I would have to touch every drawer and make sure everything was perfect, which kind of sounds like a perfectionist, but the kind of meaning behind it isn't, um, I started doing all these things and it would take me a really long time in the morning. Like I would become late for school because I was scared that my mom would die. I was scared that like loved ones would pass away if I didn't do these check around my room. Um, so when we went back to the therapist, we mentioned it to her after I told my parents, which was a long, hard conversation after about three months of doing these and not realizing what it was because I thought it would go away quick. Um, I saw she, the therapist I was seeing recommended me to Carla, um, for more OCD specialist, specialized stuff. <laughs> and we started working on different exposures, like things, for example, if I was scared that my mom was going to die, I would write on a piece of paper, my mom will die tomorrow, a million times until it made me feel less uncomfortable. <laughs> um, another really, really tough thing was writing my mom's obituary. Like I would... Mm -hmm. write my mom's obituary for a few days later and then sit with the anxiety for a few days and as you can imagine this was like the toughest thing in the world because my biggest fear felt like it was coming to life mm -hmm. um I couldn't do normal things I couldn't shower because I was scared of loved ones I'd be washing my back five times and I couldn't get dressed in the morning before school it started causing a lot of panic attacks in around fifth grade I think which caused disruption in friendships and everyday things. I couldn't go to gymnastics anymore. I was a gymnast for my whole life. Mm. Um, and this would happen because of separation anxiety from my mom, because I would worry that something bad would happen when she was away. Um, so you can imagine school is really tough. Um, so I was making some up and down progress, but we realized that I really needed something more intensive, I guess. Um, I, there were certain times where I couldn't walk normally. I would stand in between a doorway on and off and go in between the doorway like a million times in the mornings, um, which got really frustrating because ev most everyone can walk like, or not everyone, I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but it's something that you, I should have been able to do, but OCD was stopping me. Um, Carla recommended us to Bradley, which is a program in Rhode Island and I was there for 12 weeks every day for four hours plus an hour there and back drive every day. Um, I was there all summer so I missed all my summer plans <laughs> and all that kind of stuff but I was super nervous going into it but I was excited because I knew that's what I needed. Um, 
I, and I was excited for the change. Um, we did a, certain exposures there, kind of like I would do my seatbelt a million times when I got into the car. So we would sit in the car and do the seatbelt once, sit with it and wait for my anxiety to come down. Um, we did different cancer exposures because I was afraid of someone I loved getting cancer. So I would have to watch a video or read a story about someone getting cancer or someone's mom dying of cancer. Um, so that was a big one. There was times where I was afraid of getting in trouble and afraid of swearing was a big one. And I would they would make me write a swear on a sticky note and put it like under the desk of like one of the main people at Bradley <laughs> so that, <laughs> um, because they were like, oh, like you're going to be in big trouble if they find it. So that, that was, I remember one day I started bawling my eyes out because I couldn't handle the fear of someone finding that or thinking of me in that way. Um, so, but after 12 weeks, I loved the staff there. I met so many amazing friends and I could finally walk again, which was like a huge thing for me. Um, I did an outpatient study for about six months working with someone once a week there, which it was a nice change going every day to once a week. Um, I did on and off treatments up and down. I've done treatments on and off, um, had many ups and downs. Um, my parents have attended a lot of things to help me like They've gone to different talks and read books and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, things at school, I would say over the past year or two have gotten tricky with being able to write. I would have to rewrite stuff because I, mm. I, my worry started shifting towards more myself. And I would worry that something bad would happen to me if I didn't write it perfectly. Or so that, as you can imagine, got in the way of schoolwork and turning in late work and how that kind of affected my grades, which the guidance counseling, like the guidance counselors did a really good job at my school helping me with that. So that was really nice. Um, and finally, and I worked with therapists and Bradley and like I used to put my books inside and out my bag a million times and friends at school would be like, Caroline, what are you doing? Like, let's go. I used to have one of my friends zip up my lunchbox for me at school because I would have to do the zipper a million times and I didn't want the embarrassment to feel that I didn't want other people to see me doing it. So I'd be like making a joke. I'd be like, oh, zip up my lunchbox. And then eventually I think I kind of realized what I was doing. And I was like, I'm making this worse. I need to be able to zip up my own lunchbox. And after a lot of practice, that helped. I also had a lot of health anxiety. I would find a tiny bump on my arm and think I was dying. So I think that was really tricky for me as well. But I've made tremendous progress over the years and I've had intrusive thoughts a lot, which I had never experienced, I think over quarantine and COVID, which made it really difficult. Um, I fell into like a really deep state of sadness over quarantine because I was stuck at home doing Zoom school, which we did for a lot longer than a lot of schools. So I think watching everyone go back to school and then me being stuck on Zoom all day was really tricky. Um, so I, there were days I couldn't get out of bed, couldn't log on to Zoom, and that only made OCD and these intrusive thoughts worse. Um, but now I'm back in school and doing better than ever. So yeah. super busy. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that was great, Caroline. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, you know, I work with a lot of people who have OCD and they're usually kind of, you know, doing outpatient therapy primarily. So they don't know anybody else who has OCD. So what was it like for you going to an intensive treatment program for OCD and then meeting other kids just like you who ha also had OCD? So they got it. What was that like? So before I went to Bradley, I mean, I... I knew of people that had OCD. Um, some of my family members have had it, but nothing, I didn't, I felt really, I guess, kind of excluded. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, because I felt like, I was like, well, no one else takes three hours in the morning to get ready for school. Like, why can everyone else do these everyday things and I can't shower normally or I can't go to gymnastics and have fun like everyone else? Like, it really, really stunk. So I think that going to Bradley and 
going there, it was kind of eye opening to see that like I'm not alone. And like, I think it's so important for other people to know that there's so many kids struggling with this. And it's so that's kind of why like, I know we all do advocacy and all this stuff, because it's so important to like spread the word because so many people don't know enough about it. Um, and it really doesn't feel good when you have it. So it's important to spread that but it was so awesome to see other kids and I still talk to like pretty much all my friends I made there and I met Ivy through and Jenna through advocacy so and we're still friends so that's so cool (laughs) that is really cool thank you how about you Ivy um okay yeah so Caroline mentioned that she met me through advocacy and um I met Caroline about two years ago um at an OCD talk um, lecture series. It was kind of like what we're doing now. Um, it was in person, but um, I met her, and at the time, I was like so amazed. I was really, really um, in um, a dark place at the time. I was like crying. I didn't want to go into that building at all. I didn't want to like do anything having to do with OCD. Um, I hated the fact that I was diagnosed with it. Um, like, I just felt, like, so abnormal, and, like, none of my friends in school um, had it, and, like, at the same time, I actually didn't have very many friends in school, but that kind of gave, it kind of paved the way, like, my school climate, um, it kind of paved the way for, like, OCD to latch on to things that I also valued, like, if OCD hadn't been um, a part of it. So, um, right now I'm in 10th grade and I started noticing symptoms probably in like fifth grade. Um, I didn't know what my symptoms were and they largely centered around me, me being like good. I wanted to behave well for my family. I wanted to be good. I didn't want to like, I didn't want to make mistakes. I didn't want to like give my parents a reason to like disapprove of me um and so I would always step into rooms with my right foot because I like in my head I kind of said like if I step into the room with my right foot I'll do the right thing Mm. and I kind of like would do that if I stepped into a room with my left foot first I would go back out and do it again with my right foot and Uh, that kind of like dwindled off over time but in sixth grade when I transferred schools um it started to get worse because I noticed that like like I going into the school the new school like I really really wanted to perform well academically and athletically and those are two values that like I were and like still are really important to me um and so OCD kind of like latched onto that and it got worse like I would have to like shut my locker a bunch of times I couldn't like get out of the hallway sometimes and I would like really struggle with that um but it kept getting worse and so in seventh grade like I was having so many intrusive thoughts like I could barely write a paper without spending like 12 hours on it and I'm not even kidding um and like, I, I, like, felt like something was wrong with me, and so I did a lot of research, and I self-diagnosed myself with OCD, um, so later that summer, I, I remember there was, like, one moment in particular where I was, like, I have to do something about this, like, I was sick, I just had, like, a cold or something, I wanted to get into bed, and I was standing in the middle of my room for, like, an hour, I like couldn't decide which way I wanted to get into bed on the right side or the left side like because I thought that if I went on one side I would be smart and not not athletic but if I went on the other side I would be athletic but not smart and I just couldn't decide because I wanted to be both things and it really really made me anxious to think that like I could not be one of those things and it sounds like so ridiculous but it was really it was very real to me at the time And, like, I just couldn't explain how I was feeling to my parents. So that's why I turned to my best friend, Google. And (laughs) I looked up. I was like, why am I feeling this way? Why am I, like, thinking these things that, like, are just completely irrational, but they feel so real? And 
OCD came up and that was when I self-diagnosed myself with that. So I went to my parents and I said, I think I have, I need therapy because I think I have OCD. And they had never noticed a problem with me. Like I was almost like the per like picture perfect kid, like did her work, got good grades, um, did everything. So like they never like even expected that there could be a problem with me, but like I just knew because of like the internal struggle I was facing every single day. It was just really, really hard and I couldn't verbalize that. So we decided against therapy treatment in seventh grade. And um, that's one of the things that I kind of wish I had done earlier. I wish I had seeked help sooner because if you don't seek help, like OCD is just going to get worse. It just keeps growing and growing and latching on to more things. And then as OCD grows, you kind of lose your freedom to do what you want to do and not what OCD wants to do. Um, so in eighth grade, um, things got really, really bad. And I, I was struggling a lot with my sister and family. Um, the type, one of the types of OCD that I have is called emotional contamination. And so what that is, it's, it's kind of like, me thinking that if I'm around someone, I'm gonna there's gonna be like a transfer of qualities. So like, or like I would become that other person. And um, I really struggled with that with my sister, especially because we're like, we're pretty different. Like we have some similar interests, but we also have some different interests. And some of the things that she likes are not some things that I particularly like to do. And so I was really, really worried that like, if I hung out with her, if I was in the same room as her, like I would, I don't know, like I would almost become her. Um, but I'd be still stuck in my body. So that really made me anxious. And what that led to me doing is avoiding her completely. Like there were some nights where I would, literally have a panic attack if she brushed up against me like when in passing in the hallway and I felt bad because like I couldn't explain to my parents why I was acting like this and um it was kind of a struggle because they just they just saw me treating my sister so badly without the like without the knowledge that it really wasn't me doing that it was OCD and like my anxiety saying like you cannot touch your sister you can't be in the same room as her so that was really, really hard. And my family at that time, they said some pretty derogatory things just in like, like out of anger. And I honestly, I can't blame them because they didn't know I had OCD, even though I had brought it up to them. Like, they just didn't think it was a possibility. Um, and so once it got that bad where I was having like mental breakdowns every night um, or like I couldn't even like be in the same room as my sister like I like they realized that like whoa there's a problem um and that's when I I looked to a therapist and at first I got um like a general therapist like a life coach almost and um like she helped me with some of the other issues I was dealing with at school um but as time went on she um told me like I think that you might have OCD and like you might need like a different type of therapy um like other than like what I can offer and that's how I met Carla um I was 13 at the time I started treatment um and I was almost 14 um and I was like feeling out of control daily um like I I just like couldn't function I couldn't, like Caroline said, like, I couldn't leave the house without severe anxiety. Like, I couldn't eat certain things. I couldn't, like, I couldn't, there were some nights where I, like, couldn't even walk up the stairs and pass the hallway without, like, repeating that entire process, like, 20 times, maybe, and getting in and out of bed. I would do that, like, hundreds of times every night, if not, like, thousands, and I would, I would do, like, compulsive burpees, compulsive exercising, and that was hard for me, especially because exercise is something that I really, really love and value just as me. But OCD also like latched on to it. 
can be like if you did if you do like so if you do like 40 burpees you are not going to gain weight and you're not going to become unathletic and so I would do that out of the fear that I would become like unathletic or something like that and so that really took a toll on me I was getting like three hours of sleep every night mm-hmm. and um I couldn't function in the morning so um I started ERP therapy with Carla and that's exposure response prevention so you basically expose yourself to the obsession or like the fear that you have and then you try to resist doing the compulsion that like goes along with it so I started that and I think in like our first appointment one of the exposures Carla had me do was write the word that um and I couldn't do it without like severe anxiety. And I, I think I like sat there the entire meeting with like just the word fat written on a piece of paper, staring at it because I was so afraid to like become that. And yeah, I mean, after I did, I made a lot of progress with Carla, but there was one point I hit a wall and that was a little over like, a year ago, about a year and a half ago. And that was when Carla recommended Bradley. And I did not want to go at all. I thought like I didn't need help. I was doing fine. And in actuality, I really wasn't. Um, I, like I did not want to go. I just thought that because Bradley was like a hospital, I thought like, I thought that, it, I don't know. I just thought, I called it to my parents. I called it the asylum and I just had no idea like what it actually was. I was just like so uneducated about it. Um, and like, I just felt like I just didn't know how to like react. Like why were my parents putting me in this program? I was going to have to miss school. I was going to have to miss sports. And I was so like unhappy about it. But when I actually got to Bradley and met the people there, like I realized that the, the other kids, like, in the program with me, they're, like, real kids, they have, like, lives by themselves, and, like, they're just like me, like, they had to take the time away from school and, like, their normal life to, like, get their OCD and anxiety under control, and, um, like, we actually, like, weren't crazy, like, we, we could all, like, relate to each other and, um, like, understand that, like, we can, like, understand, like, the feeling of, like, bottomless terror that you get when you have, like, when you get really, really, really anxious, and so Bradley was awesome. It it was an awesome experience, and like Caroline said, I'm still in touch with um, some of the people that I met there. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, one thing that I do want to address is um, um, one of the prompts Carla gave me is, is there any advice um, for someone who's starting their journey. Um, one thing I want to really say is that treatment isn't easy at all. It's like one of the hardest things that you're ever going to do, but it's so worth it in the end. Um, and I think it's important to realize how mentally strong treatment makes you. Like you really learn how to sit with anxiety and be uncomfortable and, the more you do it, the better you get at it. It's like anything else, but it makes you like so much more intelligent and so much more patient and like so much more understanding. Like, I really don't know like who I would be without it. And like without Carla, like, I don't know where I would be. I would probably like, I really don't know, but yeah, like it's so worth it. And I know you really don't want to do it, but it's gonna be like it's gonna be a challenge too but like once you get to the other side it's so much better and it makes life so much more enjoyable so yeah thank you thank you and thank you to all three of you for being so vulnerable with your stories i really appreciate it really appreciate it so carla we've got some some questions and some prompts um coming up next did you want to get start started to get it to get into that carla well i i don't even know where those questions are where <laughs> where are they well i i can i can start how about that i'll start oh, out. i thought you meant by the audience oh, oh no. not by the i'm talking about our our own prompts our own questions. ah i see all right 
I was like, where are they on the screen? I don't see any questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it's up to you, Sean. I mean, I could ask, you can ask. Why don't you go first? I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll do the next one. Okay, so um, what was it like for you to start therapy? And what was your journey to like find the right therapist? Uh, you guys, this is all an all-encompassing kind of question. What was it like to start ERP? And has medication helped you? So there, there's a lot of questions in that. <laughs> so, so who wants to start? I can start. Okay. Uh, medication has definitely helped me, but I don't believe it was the only thing that helped me. That was also the ERP therapy. Um, so one of the first things I had to do was we wrote down like, so my biggest fear was throwing up specifically. So we would write, I would write throw up on the whiteboard. I would write puke, vomit, all the words that we could think of. And then we kept progressing. And then eventually I got to, we would open book, like cartoon books and, and like there were pictures of like cartoon characters throwing up or something. And that really triggered me. And it seems like silly at first, but the way your brain is like directing your thoughts is so crazy and so powerful that it just becomes so real. and you might feel like you're the only one, but like as Caroline and Ivy are sharing their stories, I'm like, yep, that happened to me too. I have that same thing. And it's weird because it's also like relative, like we're, it's all so close together and um, there's a lot of similar things. So you're not alone. That's the big part there. But uh, yeah, the ERP therapy was just really helpful and you do have to stick through it. Uh, it I would shake, I would squeeze my hands, I would cry. Uh, you'd also <laughs> you weren't returning. <laughs> I was what? I said you also said that you weren't returning. Oh yeah, and then I said, I, <laughs> yep, I wasn't returning. Just things like that, and in the moment, it's so stressful, and it's yeah. it's like, oh, this isn't going to actually help me, and then as soon as it does, boom, and then you keep going with it. That's probably the most important thing. The there was like a click where I had like not gotten as triggered when someone said the word like throw up and it was really weird because I had heard it and I was like why I'm like not that stressed out about that anymore and so then as we kept progressing it was just getting better and then there it is it's so much better um I also took I've been taking fluvoxamine for a really long time now that was the one that's been helping me I've gone up and I've gone down dosages and stuff like that I was on antibiotic um for pandas and stuff like that so that definitely has helped me. It just kind of boosts it. Um, but I would not have been able to do it with just medication. I seriously don't believe that. And I can't say there weren't times where I was like, where I had like suicidal thoughts because it would get so bad, like going from therapist to therapist to therapist, it was just exhausting. And I was like, okay, they're, they're, they're professionals. Like it must be me. It must be me. But really like the reality of the situation is not all therapists know CBT and ERP work and they don't all specialize in that. So you, but they are not going to say that they think they know. And that's a lot of, unfortunately what OCD is and people don't really fully understand it. So finding your way, like whatever works for you, you have to sure. also have a really strong connection with your therapist. So if you feel like they aren't respecting your boundaries, then that's not um, a good thing. I, you have to be able to talk to them about every, anything and everything. Uh, confidential, confidentiality, uh, like you going in that room should not be like, oh no danger. Although through therapy, it might feel like that. You have to acknowledge that that's different than just your safety. I feel like the first couple of therapists I had, it was, I didn't feel like they were understanding what I was going through because I had not done any exposure work with any of them, which I thought was very interesting. It was really like a general anxiety disorder, which wasn't exactly what I had, although it's anxiety, it's different. And I think that's what kind of made it so challenging to find a good one. And I say a good one, a good one for me. Um, and then I found Carla and we were able to progress. And then from there, it just went really well. But it was definitely a journey to find it. And I guess the message is like, don't blame yourself for it. It's really your comfort level and you have to be okay with changing it up. And it's normal to not be with one therapist and have all the luck. 
um, if you go with Carla, then you'll have all the luck. But like, if you go to other people before then, it might be challenging. You might not know what it, it, the issue is, but that, just know that there's something that can change by going, because there's a bunch around, um, a bunch of resources to help you, so. How about you, Carla? <laughs> the volume's getting a little funky. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think she was calling on you, Caroline. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, regarding medicine, I've been through, I feel like a million different meds. Um, I started my main medicine. I can't remember the exact name of it, but yeah. I started a medicine for OCD the same exact, I think like the same exact day that I started the Bradley program. So I think throughout Bradley, the 12 weeks I was there, I it was hard to tell which one was working, the like exposures in the therapy or the medicine. Um, I got up, we kept thinking it was the medicine and it was working, it was working. So we went up to, I think the highest dose that a kid can take on this medicine. <laughs> um, and once I was in outpatient or the study, it we started to decrease the medicine and noticing that every time I decreased it, nothing changed. And we realized that it was really the hard work that I did and the, the treatment at Bradley and the treatment with Carla that really helped. Um, now I'm on a medicine for more like depression symptoms um, and kind of mood based things. And that's really, really helped. So I think it totally depends on the person. And I think like OCD medicine didn't help me at all, the few that I was on, but the one that I'm on now that focuses more on mood has worked seeming like overnight. Like it was insane. So I think the most important thing to remember is that like, like Jenna and Ivy said, it's the hard work that matters. And while medicines can really help, like the work is so important as much as it stinks the whole entire time. Like Ivy and Jenna both said, like, it's so hard and you feel like you're stuck in your own head. And there's days where you're, you just want it to be over. Like you feel sad and you really, <laughs> it's, so I think that's tricky, but medicine has been kind of tricky for me, but I think it completely depends on the person for medicine. At least when I first saw a therapist, well, the general anxiety one, it was good for school and anxiety and friend anxiety, but it really didn't, I didn't, like Jenna said, I didn't feel like it was for me. I didn't feel like it was working as well. I saw Carla and that was like, the moment I met her, I was like, we click, like this totally works. She's so nice. And she really understood what I was getting from. I think it took me about five, three to four sessions for me to figure out what my fear was. In the back of my head, I really knew what it was, but I remember it taking me, we would just sit there talking about it for like days on days. And I remember it took so long and I finally was like, oh, like I'm scared of my loved ones passing away. And Carl was like, yes, like, yes, you've got the fear. Now we can work on it. So that was like super exciting for me as much as it stunk. It was awesome in that way. So I think that was my first experience with a therapist. So that was good. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Ivy? Anything to add? Okay, so medicine. <laughs> is, Carla knows I was dead set against it. I did not want to take medicine. I was not going to take any help. I was going to do it myself. I was going to plow through. I was like going to white knuckle through the entire thing. Um, and I, I didn't start... Um, medicine when I first met Carla and I didn't take it for about a year um, because I was being stubborn and I told myself I was not going to take medicine I didn't need the help and I was also scared that the medicine would like make me gain weight or something and or it would like make me less motivated to do well in school or sports and like, I just did not want to take it. I thought that it would, like, change my mindset. It would, like, change my mind and, like, therefore change me, which would, like, completely ruin my life and my values. And I just thought, like, I just, like, anytime I thought about it, like, taking that, like, one little pill, like, my, like, 
whole head would like blow up because it would like snowball into like worse and worse and worse. Like what happened if I took the medicine? So I was adamantly against it for like the first year of treatment. And I think I mentioned earlier, like one time I, when I hit the wall and it was like about time for me to go to Bradley, like I just couldn't do it. Like I couldn't, I couldn't function. And no matter how much um, ERP I did with Carla, like I just wasn't progressing as well as I should have. And that was when Carla and my parents really started pushing for medicine. And I think that they were right to do so. But I was just so, 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 so against it. Like, I just did not want to take it. I can't explain, like, how much I was so against it. Like, I told, at one point, I think I told my mom that, like, I would rather kill myself than take the pill. And, like, I was serious at that time. Um, so, long story short, I did not want to take the pill. And eventually, I had to. I sat in the meeting with the psychiatrist um, acting like a spoiled rotten brat. I was not going to take the medicine. I just couldn't do it. Um, I, I was just not going to open my mouth and let that pill go inside of me because it was like going to mess up my brain. I thought, um, so the first time I took the medicine, Carla came to my house and I had like a mental breakdown in front of her. Like, I just did not want to take it. I did not want to do it. I told myself I was not doing it. And eventually I did. And the second night I took like half a pill. Um, I cheeked it. Like I didn't swallow it. Once my dad left the room, I spat it out and it took a little while to like actually get me to take the pill consistently. And it took a while for it to like actually take effect. Um, and for me to notice it having an effect. Um, so like my advice regarding medicine is that no matter what you're thinking right now, it's not going to change who you are. It's just going to like attack that one area where you're experiencing symptoms. Um, so like I thought it was going to completely change my motivation, um, completely like change me as a person, like my personality. It does not do that at all. You don't have to worry about that. Um, your doctors are going to be really, really good about you. Like, figuring out what medicine works best for you. So in the rare instance that there could be side effects, like they could take you off that medication um, and possibly try a new one, try a lesser dose, try a higher dose. So it's really just figuring out what works for you. Um, I was really lucky. My doctor, um, my psychiatrist has me on 200 milligrams of Zoloft sertraline. Um, and I think it took about like six months for me to actually notice a difference, um, taking that. And it's like, it's almost like one day you wake up and like, you can just see the world clearer. Like once it takes effects, like you're still you, you're still like your same person, your values are still the same. And like, you still have like motivation. You still like all my fears were like completely irrational. It just like kind of lessened the like OCD part of my brain and so I'm glad that I'm on medicine um I still take it and yeah I mean I think that fears regarding medicine they're completely valid and like I can totally understand where like concerns could come from but you just have to kind of know that it's there to help you it's there to help guide your treatment and like Caroline and Jenna said, like medicine is not going to replace um, um, ERP and like CBT. Like that is such an important part of treatment. And I think like, I think CBT and ERP would be like, if you just took medicine and like CBT separately, I think CBT would be more effective than just medicine, but them together makes like, makes such a difference. Like that's the best pairing, I think. So I encourage you to take medicine, um, go to like a reputable psychiatrist. Um, they're going to know what they're talking about. They're going to help you. They're going to listen to you, um, what your symptoms are. And, um, but like, don't rely on the medicine. Just know that the medicine's there to help you through the like exposures and therapy that you're doing with like ERP. So, yeah.
that's pretty much all I have. Um, I know Carlin has witnessed me have a mental breakdown over a pill that's like this big. So, yeah. Well, thanks Ivy and thanks uh, the rest of the panel for that as well. And just, um, just for the sake of time, we've got about 13 minutes left. So um, I do want to talk about support systems in your life. And I know in your introductions, everyone, everybody talked about finally getting to treatment. So obviously you did have support enough to get to treatment. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering your experiences about, it says family support, but I'm going to lump any kind of support in there, sibling, peer support, whatever, any kind of uh, support structures that you had. Once you were going through therapy, what was that like for you, especially how your family supported? Because they, you know, in many cases, family members go from a place of giving reassurance and accommodation because they feel that's giving acts of love and what they're supposed to do. And then they go through treatment with their teenager, or their adolescent, and all of a sudden they can't do that anymore. And they, they don't, you don't want to exacerbate or, or, or propagate any kind of the, the compulsions and the rituals and all the things that, that everybody has learned about. So I, how has your family supported you through treatment and, and that learning curve? And um, how much do they get involved with your treatment? And uh, Jenna, I'll start with you again. Um, not trying to rush or anyth anything, but if we could keep it between three to four minutes just so we can get into some other stuff would be awesome. Okay. Yeah. So my mom was actually inserted into my treatment plan. Very like a, she was a major role. Um, growing up was the biggest fear. And then I would ask my mom for reassurance. Will I be okay? Am I going to grow up? Because I didn't flip the light switch 20 times. So she had to talk with Carla at some point and I, we would wait like 10 seconds before she answered me the first time. This was huge. So this failed multiple times in the beginning because I would throw things, break things. I would refuse. And then as we went, we would get to 30 seconds. And I noticed, okay, this is getting a little bit better. It's still tough, but I just have to wait the 30 seconds and I'll be good. And then we got to a minute. And then I would change up the questions. Instead of will I be okay, I would say, mom, I will be okay. And she just wouldn't have to say anything. But I, for some reason, me telling her that, it was helpful. Uh, if I didn't have my mom, I don't know where I'd be. That's just as simple as it really is. Uh, like, she was the person to cry to. She was the person that understood me, does understand me. This is present tense, sorry. Um, and I don't ask for reassurance anymore. That's the big line, I guess. I I don't know when the last time I asked her if I'll be okay. And that's just like me realizing that right now. That's just, and that's the, the fun thing about it is you don't really notice it until you don't have to do it anymore. And then even then it's like, oh, oh my gosh, that just like someone just threw up. Oh, I didn't even think anything of it really. <laughs> and so that's like a great feeling. Um, and I guess I'm, um, it's my parents, like my dad and my sister didn't really know much about it. They weren't really in the picture at all, mm -hmm. but they didn't make changes mom played such a big role and I think it's also hard for them because they'd hear me crying and stuff and my dad would just want to stay out of it and like have me and my mom figure it out yeah. but really it wasn't between me and my mom it was between like something inside of me and then my mom's reassurance and oh, so that yeah. was probably the biggest thing for me was the reassurance speaking and if my mom hadn't I guess to parents like the biggest thing is to keep with it and to not gang up uh the biggest thing was when my dad would say like, why is she doing that? Or question what I was doing. Because um, he was confused and that's fine. But if I would hear those comments, it would make me, it would trigger me and it would make me upset. Understanding that your child is trying is the biggest thing because it might not look like it. And oftentimes it doesn't look like it. But because it's a mind thing and you're not like saying it out loud. But they are trying and I promise that uh, because... And I can promise that because nobody wants this. Nobody wants to be dealing with this every night. So to just understand that, that's the bottom line. Right. Caroline, you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I think my whole family has been really, really supportive of it, which has been really nice. Um, I think that it's obviously for any family who's dealing with someone who has OCD is, or I, I don't want to say dealing with, but who has someone in their family who has OCD mm -hmm. knows how frustrating it can be and I think sometimes I would 
take that out on myself because I'd be like, oh, like I feel bad, like, but I can't control it. And I think sometimes my family would get frustrated and I totally get that. Like Jenna said, it totally makes sense because if I was in their position, I would completely get upset too, but, or not upset, but sometimes frustrated because I can't, you, they can't do anything that anyone can do normally. Um, and, but they were like so supportive and they really, really, really tried their best and did eventually understand it. My dad who has OCD has, and I have other family members and cousins and everything who has really helped, um, have all been really supportive and understanding. Um, but my whole family has. I think one thing to note really quick is that something that I think I would give advice on, I guess, is realizing the difference between your rational and OCD part of your brain. You Like mm. when I, like Ivy said, I would do the same thing, get in bed, get out of bed. You have to think, is getting in and out of bed 10 times going to give my mom cancer? Does that logically make any sense? And you have to kind of switch your brain out of the OCD brain, which is really, really, really tough. But switching that is so important. And I still do it to this day. I'll be doing a ritual and tapping something. And I'll be like, Caroline, like, if I tap this one more time, is that going to, like, change the outcome of my family's death? Like, not rationally. So mm -hmm. I think that's something really important. Thank you, Caroline. Ivy, to you. Um. Okay, I'm going to make this quick, but... We were talking about the like impact on family. Is that mm -hmm. what the question is? Impact so, the family, especially once you're going through treatment and they're learning all these new things like you're learning. Yeah, it's definitely hard um, at first, especially when they like don't know what's going through your head. And frankly, like if you don't have OCD, you really never will. Um, but like if someone in your family has OCD, um, like, you can't avoid the impact it's going to have on you, um, your family. I mean, my family, especially because I had OCD surrounding my sister um, and still have it sometimes, it's gotten a lot better. But, like, like, the impact was unavoidable. Like, family dinners would cause me so much anxiety. Like, I couldn't, I just couldn't function. Um, and so, out of anger, my parents would say some things that, they didn't mean, um, like, they just saw the behavior, um, like, me towards my sister and not, like, what was actually, like, like, making that happen, like, the thoughts behind it, so after those comments, like, I felt like I couldn't control it, and my parents would just out of anger say some things, like, this kid, like, what is wrong with her, there's something seriously wrong with her, they would, like, threaten to take me to the hospital, um, and, like, give me, like, an IV to, like, calm me down, because I would be so, like, riled up about the smallest thing, and I just couldn't explain, like, what was going on with me, and, like, they thought that, like, I could have, like, a problem, so they did say some things out of anger, and that made me feel really, really bad. Um, I felt like I was, like, just, like, a burden. I think one time they told me, which we joke about now, um, that I held the house hostage and it really wasn't me holding the house hostage. It was the OCD. Yeah. Um, which they didn't know at the time. They didn't know that I had it. Um, so sometimes I think that those comments contributed to like, I had suicidal ideation. Um, so like I had thoughts of killing myself, um, because I just couldn't like verbalize how I was feeling and what was going on, like, this constant battle in my head, so I had that, um, for a little while, and I was only recently able to come to terms with that, but, like, it's just, it's hard on the family, and so, like, my advice would just be to, like, like Jenna said, like, know that, um, you're trying, like, know that your family member's really trying, like, even if it might not look like they are, they really are trying their best, um, and it's, like, I know things may seem, like, really, really little or, like, irrelevant, but to someone with OCD, it could be, like, blown out of proportion, and it could seem like their, like, life matters upon this, like, one little compulsion, like, turning the light switch on and off one more time. Yeah. So, yeah, just try and slow down, be understanding, and um, 
like just know that they are trying to get better. I just Thank want you. to interject briefly. I just want to say that OCD is a family affair. It just doesn't only affect that one person, but it affects everybody in the entire household. So it is so important when when there's treatment involved, like when when you're engaging in treatment, that family members are involved because family members also need to work through, you know, those hard times when you're triggered and they have to work through, you know, how to not accommodate you uh, or accommodate the OCD, I should say. Um, so it's really, it's a family affair and family members should be involved in treatment. Mm -hmm. so. so Carla, we're kind of getting to the end. You want me to wrap it up a little bit? Yeah, well, I wanted to ask that one question. Ivy had already answered it a little yes, bit. Yes, Ivy did a great job, yeah, earlier. Yeah, but I'd like to also hear from uh, Caroline briefly and also Jenna briefly. So there is someone out there right now that's watching you guys. They're just struggling. They're at the start of their journey, in the middle of their journey. They're just struggling. What words of advice do you have for them to kind of help them stay motivated and moving forward? Go ahead, Jenna. It's really, you have to take the little things with like, a, like give them a lot of credit. Um, like I said, the 10 seconds and the 30 seconds, it's 20 seconds, but it helped me so much because I was able to see that little progress. And of course there are good days and there are bad days, um, but like the reality is there's more good than bad. And so when you get that extra 10 seconds or 20 seconds of like resistance for asking for reassurance or whatever your case is, take that and like run with it and be super proud of yourself for that and give yourself credit even if nobody else is giving you credit because that in itself is super accomplishment that's like I just said that weird that's like an accomplishment a huge accomplishment yeah. and yeah. little thing you, yeah just taking little things and making them bigger for yourself maybe even writing them down putting them in a box like I did this today or one good thing because it's really hard to see the good things when it's all in your head as negative mm -hmm. negative negative so taking it day by day as weird as that or cr cringy as that sounds <laughs> <laughs> that's great thank you and how about you Caroline um yeah I think the biggest thing just like Jenna said is be gentle with yourself really realize the even the smallest goals for you sometimes I think you can compare it to other people like you can see I remember when I was in Bradley I was there for so long and I'd see people leave after six weeks and I'd be like why can't that be me and I think you have to realize that it's okay to go at your own pace. And that's the best way you're going to help yourself. Like, I think just exactly what Jenna and Ivy said, be gentle with yourself, really try and separate the rational and irrational part of your brain, which is so important. So I think, yeah. yeah. And I think having those, like having those battles, like I've dealt with the suicidal thoughts, with the intrusive thoughts and everything inside of your head is so difficult that trying to separate those and write things down and check things off is really important. Thank you so much, you guys. Yeah. So brave, so inspirational, and you're helping people out there just by being here tonight. So thank you. Thank yeah, you guys yeah. for watching too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so yeah. much for joining. I hope it helped. And if you Absolutely. have any questions, just like reach out to me. Um, I think you can reach out to Carla. Um, I think she has my email. Um, always feel free to reach out. I'm always here. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I want to thank the panel for just being on here and their bravery and telling their story and their camaraderie with the OCD community, with each other, uh, how important this is, how important their advocacy is. Um, really blows me away that you come on here. Uh, I don't know if I would have been able to do this uh, as a teenager. Um, you all three of you have really, really inspired me uh, tonight. So it's been, it's been great. And we clearly have just talked about the tip of the iceberg. We had so many, so many things to talk about. And yeah. so maybe this is something that we, we come back to at another time and get to more in-depth questions and stuff like that. Because there's a lot to talk about, especially with teen and ad adolescent mental health, specifically OCD. So maybe this is something that we'll have to come back to um, in the fall, which brings me to the fact that this is actually our last lecture uh, of the season. Boo hoo! Uh, we'll be <laughs> taking we'll be taking a two month break, and we'll be starting back in September. So please follow us on Facebook, OCD Massachusetts, 
or Instagram, OCD Massachusetts, and visit our website, www.ocdmassachusetts.org. Uh, I don't know if the attendees uh, noticed, but I did put some resources in the chat. You can go ahead and click on those for resources. The Bradley program's in there. Some books um, that the girls recommended, I try to put in there. Um, you can always go to the IOCDF or OCD Massachusetts for additional resources. Um, also coming up, the 1 million steps for OC walk uh, will be taking place in person this year, September 18th. Uh, OCD Massachusetts will have a walk team and we hope that you will join us at Carson Beach this year. Uh, and again, please follow us on social media for all the updates. And uh, like the panel said, thank you to the attendees who um, uh, learned and um, got everything, got so much out of uh, what a, just a, a wonderful panel of three amazing advocates. Um, and that's all I have to say, Carla. I didn't know if you wanted to end on anything yourself. I don't think so really, but um, I guess the only thing I'd like to say is I would love to see more and more people join the OCD Massachusetts team and participate in the 1 million steps for OCD walk. Caroline, our panelist, she did an amazing job last year. We, it was really a, kind of a virtual walk last year because of the pandemic, but she raised so much money for the International OCD Foundation and she did it herself. And by doing that, she raised awareness about OCD. So we really hope to continue. I mean, every year we, we grow bigger and bigger. So um, I hope people join because it helps. It helps with research. It helps with awareness. It's, it's just a really great place for people to come together and, um, you know, just raise awareness for the greater good. So I hope we see everybody in the fall. Yeah. All right. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to OCD Massachusetts. We have a Facebook page. We also have a website. Our email is info at ocdmassachusetts.org. So if anyone has any questions, questions about the, uh, tonight's talk, certainly feel free to send us an email. And thank you all for attending. This is wonderful. Thanks, yep. guys. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a nice week. Bye. Bye.